But let's look at war. The definition, you know I love definitions. The definition of war is a state of armed conflict between nations or states or groups. We all understand that type of war. But we have an unseen, but you might ask a question, is there an unseen war, a war going on today? Yes, I will tell you with a surety that we are fighting a spiritual battle and the warfare is real. And it's hard to see sometimes because we can't see it. We know what's in front of us. But this has been going on a long time. Look, look at Jesus talking to his disciples here at John. He says, these things I have spoken to you that in me you may have peace. Peace in all of the stuff that's going on. In the world, you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. He's saying, in this life, you're going to have hard times. In this life, you're going to have trials. And especially when you call yourself a Christ follower, the enemy is going to release everything that he can out there to get you to go under and stop and unenlist in this army. Real spiritual war is happening, and we are a part of it. Does anybody feel like you're under attack? She acted. Anybody? Hey, we did circle up out there. Everybody had both their arms up right now. Because everybody is under attack right now. With some Life can get uncertain. Your faith can get shaky. And you might be struggling in your mind. Come on, the enemy right now is messing with people's minds right now at an all-time at an all-time rate. He might be messing with your health. He might be messing with your relationship. It may be causing stress and anxiety and fear to come. And, but why are we in this spiritual battle? Let's go back to Genesis. We're going to read the whole Bible today. In Genesis, God created... Yeah, y'all say that. and you got, You'd be having me on the clock for five more minutes. But we go back to Genesis, and God created paradise. He created a perfect place... He gave it to us freely, and he gave us a choice. He wanted us to have free will. Listen, what God did is he gave us dominion, and he gave us authority over everything. But in the middle of that garden, oh, here's the one that gets us. In the middle of that garden, he placed a choice. Listen to what Genesis says. And the Lord commanded the man, saying, of every tree in the garden... You may freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat it. For in that day you eat, you shall surely die. He's going to say, maybe you're going to die. It says, you shall surely die. God gave us free will to make our own choices. And guess what? If you've been in church long enough, we made the wrong choice. And when we made the wrong choice, how many has had to pay for the wrong choices in their life? How many have had to pay for the things that you've done and wish you could take back? But let me tell you, oh, we'll talk about how that choice got took back on the cross in just a little while. But, but what happened is, is that choice opened the opportunity up for sin and disobedience to enter into the world. And it also, that choice separated us from our God. It allowed the enemy to have more access to us. Before that, we, they walked in the cool of the day in the garden with God. They had access to him. And as soon as they made that bad choice, that was separated can I just be honest with you? You have a real, oh, you got to listen to this part right here. You have a real enemy. And we don't talk about him anymore. When I grew up in church, you talked about the devil every Sunday. Sometimes it was hell and brimstone and devil, seven services a month, right? Anybody ever grow up, grow up like that? You know, I scared to death most of the time. Until I found about what the grace of God was all about. But we quit talking about him. And in Genesis 3, we got introduced to the serpent. Who, who was also called the devil. He's also called Satan. He's also called Lucifer and the enemy. Look what it says in Isaiah. It says, how you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground, you who... Weaken the nations. For I have said in my heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of congregation on the furthest sides of the north. Listen, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds and I will be like the most high. 
Here was a created being. He had a high position. His ego caused him to fall. His pride caused him to go in a different direction. But here's what he did. He was crafty enough. I know some of this may be elementary. Some of this may be like whoop. But he was crafty enough to convince a third of the angels to go down with him. Can you understand what an influencer is? Do you all want the modern day influencer? Right? They want you to buy this cosmetic cream. And they got this pretty girl. And she's going to influence you to do that. I don't even know what else they influence. But they're, but they're influencing us on social media all of the time. And we buy the product. But here, the great influencer, the biggest influencer, convinced a third of the angels to leave heaven. Ouch! How crafty could he be? But let me tell you that. He's still doing that today. He's still influencing influencing us and telling us lies and manipulating us. He's everything that God isn't. He's the complete total. You heard of opposites attract. They don't in this case, but he's the opposite of what God is. He's a thief, and God is a giver of life. He's a murderer, and God brings life. He's the accuser, and Jesus is our advocate. Everything that God is, the devil wants. He was kicked out of heaven. Let me show you something he says right here. Hold on. I got, I'm getting ahead of myself or behind myself here. Isaiah 14, 15 says, You shall be brought down to Sheol, which is death, to the lowest depths of the pit. That's where the enemy uh, is going to be. He was cast into nothingness, but when God created life, it also brought him back to life. Come on, y'all know what I'm talking about? Sometimes you gotta let something die. There are things in your life that you keep breathing life into, and God says, I want that thing to be dead in your life. There's so many things in your life that you keep trying to resuscitate, and God says, I want you to let that thing go ahead, rest in peace, whatever it is. Satan was called the ruler of this world, and when Adam made the choice, he was given authority, and we relinquished all of the rights that we had because of a bad choice. We have to be on guard. I'm telling you this morning, and we're going to talk in the next few weeks about our weapons. We have to be on guard in this war because 1 Peter says this. It says, be sober. And I wrote some more words in there. Be sober. Be vigilant. Be serious. Be sensible. Your adversary, be careful, watch, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. But listen to me. Oh, this is right here. This is the part that may get me in trouble, but I don't care. We have desensitized ourselves to who the enemy is. He's that cute little costume on Halloween. Oh, Pastor Rich, you're going to go there? Yup. He's that bad guy that sits on your shoulder. You know, the, the bad one that sits over here telling you all the bad stuff to do, and you got the angel over here telling you all the good stuff. He's that bad guy that sits over there. And listen. Glad you said that. TV shows are making light of who the enemy is. There's a show called Little Demons that is coming out. And the whole show is about a woman who is impregnated by Satan. And she has now birthed the Antichrist's daughter. And can I be honest with you? They made this into a cartoon. And the quote they said was, they're trying to, oh, this ought to scare you to death. They're trying to normalize paganism. Do we live in a crazy world or what? I I know everybody had a hocus pocus party a couple weeks ago. I actually ended up watching it. In the first couple minutes, they were laughing about taking the Lord's name in vain. There was witchcraft all over that. And in one part of it, they mentioned Lucifer in the incantation and just laughed about it. That's what the enemy is. He is real. He is dead serious. He wants both death and spiritual, both physical and spiritual death to you. He's not an animated character. He's not someone we can take lightly. We have to understand we are fighting a real war. 
John 10, 10 says, the thief does not come except to steal, to kill, and destroy. And as much as we talk about the love of God, the love of God is so vast and it's so deep and it's unconditional and we can't understand it. Can I just tell you something this morning? That's how much the devil hates you. As much as God loves you, that's how much the devil hates you. Why? Because Genesis 2, 7 says this, the Lord formed the man out of the dust of the ground. And he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. The Bible says we are God's masterpiece. We are fearfully and we are wonderfully made by God. You have God's breath and you take a deep breath. I know we've done it before. Sometimes we forget who's inside of us. But you know why he hates you so much? Because you remind. <laughs> You have the characteristics of your father. He hates you so much because you look like your daddy. You also remind him. Some of you never mind. I almost got myself in some trouble there. You remind him of who he's not and what he can never have. You gotta understand, sometimes you have to identify and know who your enemy is. The armed forces, and y'all help me, I've never been in. I look good in uniform, but I've never been in. The armed forces will identify their target before destroying it. They will put radar out there and they're gonna identify this thing. Our spiritual radar is called discernment. And it will distinguish what discernment is, it distinguishes from right. From wrong, it helps you to judge well in certain situations and circumstances. It's the biggest weapon that we need to sharpen our perception of what's going on around us. You know why you have to be sharp in the times that we live in? Because what you see is not what you always get. 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen says this, and no wonder. For Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Devil comes as an angel of light. He hides under the cover of light. Listen, they're not even trying to hide anything anymore. I know this is heavy in this, but they're not even trying to hide it anymore. It's coming right out there in, in plain sight. It, it, it's like they're trying to rub, uh, rub our noses in it. But that's good because we can get a plan how to fight that thing in a future battle. But listen, the devil comes as an angel of light. Adam and Eve saw the fruit. I started to put apple in there. That would be incorrect. They saw the fruit. And what did it say in there? It said it looked good. It looked pleasant. And it was desirable to eat. That's the same thing he's doing today. Don't you want to be happy? Come on. Don't you, you need to find someone to make your happiness. You need to find this thing or that thing to make you happy. He puts it out on social media where you can see everybody's happy life that they're living. Come on, you all know what I'm talking about out there. You scroll all day long and you wish you had the life that they had, but if you only knew the life that they had, you would wish that you did not have that life. But he puts it out there and makes it look so good. Listen to this one. One time can't hurt you. That's how addictions start. When I, if I was preaching this to a bunch of young people, I'd say one time can't hurt you. But we've desensitized ourselves to that. And we also ask the question, but that friend really did mean well, or they do mean well. Be careful who you hang out with because not everybody's got your back. Anybody, can y'all get an amen on that one? Amen. There are people that you think have your back. As soon as, ha, as, soon as your back is turned, <laughs> Be careful. You find out who your friends are. I had to do that one. That was bad. But it all looks good. The Bible even says sin is pleasurable for a season. 
He's still using the same tactics. He's still using doubt and manipulation and intimidation and also condemnation, which we'll talk about in future weeks. His plan has not changed, and we are fighting a spiritual battle. We're going to read Ephesians 6, 12. Oh, they are, you know when we start reading Ephesians, you're in trouble, right? <laughs> but listen, it says, We are not fighting or wrestling against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in the dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. Even though it may not look like a physical war, there are casualties in a spiritual war. Listen, the crime rate's crazy. There's division in the right and the left, and we have racial divides going on right now. We have divorce that is tearing families apart. And do you know this? Suicide has tripled over the last two years. The enemy wants you to believe, listen to me, he wants you to believe this, the person sitting next to you. Oh, wives, don't even look at your husbands right now. Because you might be saying, that he is the enemy. But he wants you to believe that it's your spouse. Kids, he wants you to believe that it's your parents, right? And you've got any teenagers in the house. You can't do nothing right, right? But he also wants you to believe it's your family. He wants you to believe it's your friends. But listen, it may not be the person standing next to you or sitting next to you or in the grocery store to you. You can't always see it because it's a spiritual battle. How can we fight against these things that we can't even see? How do you even wage war? I'm asking a lot of questions because we're going to answer some of these questions over the next few weeks. How do you wage war against that kind of an enemy? Here's what we usually do. You seasoned church people, you need to pray more. You need to read your Bible more. And you definitely better get to church at least three times a month. I did three. That was awful. Those are usually the questions that we, those are usually the answers we give some. And let me, I'm not minimalizing that that at all. These all work. And they are part of the plan. But are we putting them to work? Are we praying? Are we reading our Bible? Are we attending church? Are we gathering right now? Sometimes we have to have some basic knowledge and training. But if you have the basics, sometimes you have to be advanced to go into the intensive. You have to be intentional about some of the training that you get. 